from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first great and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. at this time didst teach the hearts of thy faithful people by sending to them the light of thy Holy Spirit. Grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort. Through the mass of Christ Jesus our Savior, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the same Spirit, one God, world without end.
14th chapter, beginning at the 15th verse. At that time, Jesus said unto his disciples, If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away, and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. I believe in one God, the Father Lord Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, earth of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again in glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, 
He proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Good morning and welcome on this feast of Pentecost or Whitsunday. It is actually counted as equal importance with Christmas and Easter. It's often, of course, kind of gets neglected. I'm so glad you're here with us to keep this feast with as much splendor as we can muster. A few things to note this week. Pentecost, like Easter and Christmas, is followed by a week called an octave, and there are special services each day, and you can see them noted in the uh, booklet. Next Sunday, the octave closes with Trinity Sunday, and as our custom is, there'll be brass at Coral Matins on that occasion, and if you'd like to contribute to the cost of the brass, those donations will be gratefully accepted and any intentions or memorials that accompany those will be acknowledged in the bulletin. After June the 4th, that is on June 11th, we will be moving to a shortened summertime service schedule. And it is easy to remember because it's just what our old schedule used to be. So 8 o'clock will continue unchanging. It never changes. Uh, and then Sunday school will be at 9.30, and the main service, which is both family and main services combined, will be at 10.30, and there will be age-appropriate education for the young folks during the sermon that will take place in the chapel. And this will last from June 11th through to early August, um, but not next Sunday. Uh, on Tuesday the 13th, uh, we are going to have a very special visitor, uh, Bishop Fanuel Magangani of Northern Malawi. Those of you who've been around for a while will remember our connection with the church in Malawi goes back a long time. It is a uh, country of 20 million people in South Central Africa, uh, one of the poorest uh, in the world. 80% population is Christian. Uh, we've been uh, long supporting a convent of Anglican nuns here in the States, the community of St. Mary. They've been developing a daughter house in Malawi, and there are now ten sisters there, uh, all local women who've given their lives to the service of Christ in this particular way. They have a nine-acre farm on which they grow food for themselves and for the orphans, uh, to whom they have a special ministry. They also uh, sew uniforms for clergy and school to bring in a little cash, but they need to build a convent. And they have the land, they have the plans, uh, they are, their bishop, Bishop Penuel, is on tour uh, next month in the uh, United States uh, among our, the Anglican partners, of which we are one. So he will be here on Tuesday the 6th in the church to speak about the work and ministry of the Anglican Church in Malawi and especially uh, the work and hope for this convent and their ministry uh, in that place. And then the fundraising side of the equation comes in the reception that follows. This will be ticketed at $50 a person. There will also be sponsorships for $250, $500, and 1000 I know that not everyone can give uh, as generously as that, but those who can, I do appeal to you to be as generous as you can be uh, and to support uh, this ministry. You should know that the bishop's travel, lodgings, and the expenses of this reception have all been covered by donors, so your gift will go directly to the building fund for the nuns and sisters of St. Mary in Malawi. So that's Tuesday, um, uh, the 13th of June at 6 o'clock here at St. John's. And I, as I say, the bishop's address will be open uh, without charge to all. 
Today is the Sunday also before Memorial Day, and as our custom is, we're going to stand and sing both stanzas of the National Anthem. <laughs> From St. John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said unto his disciples, If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The book of Exodus gives us a kind of template for God's saving action in history. It begins with the compassion of God, his compassion on his people in their misery, and his remembrance of his promises because he is the God who keeps faith. And uh, he delivers his people from the powers that hold them in bondage, and he guides them through the wilderness. And there, on his holy mount, he unites them to himself in a holy communion and fellowship of the covenant, that they may be his people and he may be their God. And that takes us to about chapter 24 of Exodus, and many people stop reading about there, if not earlier. But, in fact... The climax of the book, the culmination of God's saving action, is, comes at the very end of Exodus because with the covenant in place, God gives instructions by Moses for the building of a tabernacle, a tent or a portable temple, and its furnishings. And when all is made ready, uh, the cloud of glory fills the temple. And uh, this is not somehow a kind of afterthought or appendix. Um, when God takes possession of his house, he dwells among his people. He fills that house with his glory. That indeed is the whole point of his saving action, that he might dwell among his people 
as their king and shepherd and Lord to save them, to guide them, to bless them. As he says, I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And so this indwelling of God's presence among his people signified by the tabernacle is, uh, and just so you caught it, is conditional on their faithfulness in love and obedience to the terms of the covenant. Uh, and as we know from reading the Old Testament, that faithfulness to the covenant became a challenge. But as with the old covenant, even so much the more with the new, the whole point of the saving action of God in Christ, the whole point of sending Christ into the world, the whole point even of his dying and rising again, is that the Lord might dwell among his people, that he might be their God, that they might be his people. And if you remember that, then the words which Jesus spoke at the Last Supper to his disciples fit right within this template. What does he say? If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth who dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So Jesus may be leaving the world uh, to go to the Father, but his absence from the world is not an absence in the disciples. For them it means a new, full, intimate, indwelling presence by the Spirit. As Jesus says, I will not leave you comfortless. Literally, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. He promises a real presence among his disciples by the Spirit that the Father will give. And if the Son is present with his disciples in the Spirit, then so also must the Father be. And that's precisely what Jesus says, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So this promise that in Christ going from the Father, we're not left bereft, we're not left orphans, we in fact uh, enter into a, a fuller, deeper communion, fellowship, and presence of God, Father, Son, by the Spirit. And it is the keeping of this promise made first by the prophets and now by Jesus to his disciples that we celebrate on this Feast of Pentecost or Whitsun Day, which is why, of course, it is one of the three great days of the Christian year. Uh, and we heard in Acts Luke's account of how it happened, how the Spirit was poured forth on the disciples as they met with one accord in prayer, and they were empowered to speak in all languages of the world the wonderful works of God, a kind of miraculous publication of the gospel which signified the universal reach of Christ's kingdom. And when you read that second chapter in Acts, you also hear indeed about Peter's preaching and then the conversions that followed, and a new community that emerges in Jerusalem, one that is indeed indwelt by the Spirit, in which this presence of God is manifested in acts and deeds of power. Christ, we are redeemed by the blood of Christ, precisely that God might dwell among us and be our God, and that we might be his people. But with this special difference between the Old Testament and the New, that Christ does not dwell in a temple or tabernacle made by hands. The temple in which he dwells is a living temple. It is comprised of living stones. It is nothing else than the company and fellowship of the disciples of Jesus. And so it becomes a standard theme in the New Testament 
that those who are in Christ, those who have, are built upon him, the sure foundation, are built an habitation of God by the Spirit, a temple of God comprised of living stones indwelt by the Spirit. And this presence of God in truth and in the Spirit, this communion and fellowship with God that is not merely symbolic but real, this is, of course, precisely what we assemble in the administrations of the Lord's Supper for. This is the sign of that presence and the effectual means by which we, in faith, may participate and share in that presence. So on the one side, we've got something wonderful to celebrate, a wonderful blessing to give thanks for, the uh, fulfillment of God's promise of the spirits of, and by whom we have the indwelling presence of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there's the other side, which I've already mentioned, which has to do with the faithfulness in the template. It's the faithfulness of Israel to the covenant stipulations, the commandments of God. That's the condition upon which the indwelling presence of God is bestowed. And Jesus uses exactly the same language when he speaks to his disciples at the Last Supper. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall send you, uh, give you another comforter, the Spirit of truth. And he says it not just once, but again, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And again, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And just to underline the point, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Love and obedience. You can't separate them one from the other. Nor can you separate them from the faith which trusts in God. If you... Uh, uh, you can't obey Jesus without loving him and trusting him. You can't love him without trusting him and obeying him. You can't trust him without loving him and obeying him. The three are tightly interwoven. We are indeed justified by faith alone, but faith is not alone. It is always accompanied by love, which finds expression in obedience. Uh, and so there is always this uh, in, uh, inseparable threefold cord of trust and love and obedience, which is the condition of God's indwelling presence among us by his Spirit. It's very striking in John's Gospel, if you're reading up to this point in chapter 14, what you hear about is God's love for the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Or you hear of Jesus' love for his disciples. And then in chapter 13 at the Lord's Supper, Jesus commands them to love one another as he has loved them. And now you might say that's the, the pivot where the love of God manifested to us in Christ known and received by faith, now gives birth to love for the brotherhood and love for Jesus manifested in obedience to his commandments. That too is part of the completeness of God's saving action in Christ. Not simply that he should reveal his love to us, but that he should, we should respond to his love first in faith, and then in the love and obedience which springs from faith.
It's when you read the epistles of John, they are uh, bring down the, uh, simplify our obligation to God precisely in those terms. It's faith in God, faith in Christ, love for God, love for the brotherhood, and obedience to his commandments. And of course, there's lots of other parts of that, right? There's the moral law. There's the commission to bear witness in his name. But all these spring from are included in these commandments of faith and love and obedience. So just as the Israelites of old time, when they were commanded by Moses uh, with the commandments of God, carried out God's instructions set forth in his word using their God-given gifts in God-given tasks according to a God-given plan and built a tabernacle in which God could take up, uh, bestow his presence in the form of the cloud of glory. So we, uh, using our own God-given gifts and um, uh, God-given skills in the faith and love and obedience of Christ, we too are being built up in holy temple, a living temple which God can take possession of, that it, we may be his people and he may be our God. Now, what this really means for us is very simply this. You've heard me say this before, um, but maybe this time you'll hear it in a different way. Uh, it is very easy for North Americans to be religious consumers. Our culture teaches us to be consumers. We're very good at it. Um, and our tendency is to transfer that set of habits and skills uh, that we make us good consumers, people who consult their own taste and opinions and budget and decide what's good for them, uh, to transfer that set of attitudes over to our religion. And the point of, you might say, this is you cannot do that. Uh, if indeed we know our faith and love by our obedience to God's commandments, that means we are not the ones who are calling the shots. We are not the ones who decide when and when we won't do what God wants, what God says in his word. Obedience is the test of faith and love for God. If you say you believe in God and you love God, but you don't do what he says, you don't believe in him and you don't love him. You may believe in him a little, you may love him a little, but you don't love and believe in him as your God. You believe in yourself as your God. So this is a call for surrender. This is a, when we're called, the, the conditions upon which God's indwelling presence may be vouchsafed to us, that we may have communion and fellowship with God in holiness, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that we may receive Christ really present by means of this sacrament. The condition is of faith and love and obedience is indeed surrender. And you know how weak our faith is, how lukewarm our love may be, how half-hearted our obedience, how short-term our good resolutions are. We make them and a minute later we've already broken them. We make promises to God and Five minutes later, we take them back. That is indeed our mortal frailty. Um, but it's simple. We repent. We surrender once more. We renew our resolutions of faith and love and obedience. And we pray that Christ will send his Holy Spirit, that he will fill the hearts of his faithful people and that he will indeed enkindle in them the fire of his love. The fire is burning and lit on the temple. Now is the time for us to throw ourselves into that fire. It is a lot to surrender yourself, but Christ surrendered himself for you.
And now he calls you to join him. power and glory and honor and wisdom and bless
come with thee, O Lord.
Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, we humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our alms and oblations and to receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also so to direct and dispose the hearts of all Christian rulers that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear. Beseech thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to give us grace, O, to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. He who do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbors, and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God, and walking from henceforth in his holy ways. Draw near with faith, and take this holy sacrament to your comfort, and make your humble confession to Almighty God, devoutly kneeling. Almighty God, Father, Father of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time have previously have committed, by thought, word, and deed, against thy divine majesty. Provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us, we do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings, the remembrance of that mysterious unto us, the burden of that is intolerable. Have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, to forgive us all those past, and grant that we may ever hereafter. Serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those with hearty repentance and true faith for the have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear what comfortable words our Lord Jesus Christ said. Come unto me, all you prevail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. So God loved the world, and he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hear also what St. Paul said. This is true saving, worthy of all men to receive, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear also what St. John said. If any man said we had an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. The Lord be with you. And with our spirit. Lift up your hearts. We Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and abundant duty 
that we should at all times and at all places give the thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, according to whose most true promise the Holy Ghost came down at this time from heaven, lighting upon the disciples to teach them and to lead them into all truth, giving them boldness with fervent zeal, constantly to preach the gospel unto all nations, whereby we have been brought out of darkness and error into the clear light and true knowledge of the gospel of the high Son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, to celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty, with these thy holy gifts which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty God, goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving 
most humbly beseech thee, thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him that he may dwell in us, and we in him. And although we are worthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as this. But thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so that we can flash with thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our soul washed with his most precious blood, that we may ever more dwell in him and he in us. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Blessed are they who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank thee. For thou dost speed us, we will receive these holy histories with the spirit of the truth of the most precious body and love. Thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and thus we serve and thy and that we are Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing, mercy, and grace of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
Holy Ghost. Praise Him and magnify Him forever. 